Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, this is the first Twitter space that we've done through Inside Exploration. So I just want to start off by thanking everybody for attending this. I'm Mike Coyle. I'm your host from Inside Exploration. And today I'm going to be speaking with Frank Dumas, who is the COO of St. George Eco Mining, which can be found on the CSE under SX or the OTC under SXOOF. Frank, thanks for taking the time to join me today. Hello, Mike. Hope uh, everything is Hi. doing better on your side. Well, with all the restrictions lifting, life is getting back to normal again, so that's always nice. And you? Well, I'm doing okay. We're busy uh, and just trying to get things moving on every front. Excellent. Well, let's just jump right into it then. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I guess one of the big things on my mind has been spot you mean, because I see that as one of the verticals that is closest to coming to fruition for St. George Eco Mining. So why don't you talk to us about how you've been making out on the spot you mean front first? Uh, okay. Well, first, uh, I don't know if it's the first thing that's going to come to fruition because the batteries are going at a pretty fast pace also. So that probably the first, uh, bracket I would open and close that. Uh, the, the spodumene is interesting because uh, we can access uh, spodumene concentrate from different suppliers, and that's what we've been doing for the last few months, uh, receiving a few kilos to up to, uh, you know, quantity in, in measured in tons that uh, we're getting from potential suppliers. So we're at the level now where we clean up the pilot plant, we get a new batch from the suppliers, and uh, we test it and we share the results with them and we share the results also with potential off-takers uh, for the lithium. We're not doing uh, lithium hydroxide just yet. We're waiting on our Japanese suppliers and Italian suppliers for some equipment for that, that uh, phase on the transfer. But we're able to do lithium carbon fairly uh, The goal at this stage for us to be able to measure it, uh, we seem to have lost you frank can you try to get back into a better service area That's okay so okay. you heard anything about my answer regarding uh spodumene no just saying that it wasn't the first vertical that you believe would uh produce revenue for saint george so after that <coughs> you cut out so All take right, it so, from the top um i'm just going to reiterate that it's more a matter of i don't know um, I don't know if it's going to be the first vertical or if battery would be there first. So what we've been doing so far is getting suppliers to send us spodumene concentrate from different uh, source. And obviously suppliers are providing us with different type of spodumene concentrate. Uh, there's different contaminant. We're conducting tests with that, uh, you know, cleaning up the pilot plant, moving a, a batch uh, through uh, the testing phase, and we're getting uh, we're getting samples from a few kilos to uh, a few tons in terms of uh, of size, and uh, that's probably going to keep going until uh, the mid to the end of the second quarter this year. Now, the we're not only testing what we can do with it and uh, what kind of problems we're getting with some of the material, but mostly. We're testing uh, the suppliers itself. If they can provide, what are they providing? And if uh, the specs are up to what they, they told us it would be. We're not uh, doing, we're not converting anything in uh, hydroxide just yet. We're doing uh, carbonite, uh, lithium carbonate uh, right now. Um, we're waiting on a supplier's uh, equipment supplier in Japan and Italy to get us the uh, equipment to do the, the next step to the adrug side. Okay, can you expand on the Zinwaldite um, and how you're looking at recovering lithium from that? This is a rather new oh, development. Zinwaldite is, if, if you go back, you remember we had Gary Johnson uh, as one of our director, and Gary Johnson as Lithium Australia and, and Lepidico and a few of these other companies that he works with. He's the, probably, I think, the president of Lepidico. Uh, Gary had exposed us to alternative source of our drug nickel, and most of the alternative source are in uh, micas. So lipidolite would be one. Uh, 
you have petalite would be another and then you have uh, zinwandite and uh, we had that in the back of our heads knowing that we have uh, at Le Royal a small group of claims owned by St. George on which we have lipidolite a little bit of lipidolite uh, enough to conduct tests and that lipidolite is often also a byproduct of other production of uh, tin and things like that so there is tailings of that material for example in Romania and countries like that the owner of these projects uh, are uh, in touch with us the zinwandite is something it's a discussion we had with a uh, up and coming fertilizer producer that's about to be commercial this summer and told us that we have this big dike of like uh, a, about 30 to 40 million tons of material and it's uh, I don't want to say populate but contaminated with zinwandite now zinwandite by default uh, if you look at the chemical composition has a good amount of lithium in it uh, but it's a refractory like every other micas it's a refractory material so traditional uh, uh, process to extract the lithium using uh, that, that will eat it up or, or, or uh, that will convert it using heat uh, and then using acids for uh, the separation or the, the selective leach or the recovery is not something that works very well. Uh, so we actually got into the discussions. Look, we did actually succeed with petalite and with lipidolite. There's no reason why we would not be able to get some good results with your material. So they process a ton of it, ship it to us, and uh, we're looking at doing some tests. And if it goes well, then we might have a, uh, a client slash partner deck that will be able to provide us with a material that's Quebec-based and for which there's really no competition for the processing. Excellent. All right, let's talk about the nickel cadmium batteries. This is really interesting. You know, you've been uh, touted as a battery recycler. You've been looking at all the various types of batteries, but you've chosen to focus on the nickel cadmium uh, battery. Why is that? I missed your question. Uh, hold on a second. I had this problem there again, another application. I'm just going to fix this. Give me a quick second. And then, okay. So, All right. Can you yeah, hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So, um, nickel cadmium batteries. You've chosen to focus on this as your first uh, battery recycling strategy. Why is that? Well, first, we're actually focusing on two different uh, type of batteries. And one is the lithium iron uh, phosphate or the life battery. And the other one is the nickel cadmium. First, uh, it's a question of uh, availability. How much of it is, is available out there? Uh, there's a lot. And it's coming from different uh, sources. It's the, in case of the nickel cadmium, uh, a lot of it's coming from your power drill uh, rechargeable batteries, uh, AAA, AA, uh, the C batteries that you have that you buy at Home Depot or, or place, uh, not to do a shameless plug here, but uh, everything that's recyclable, uh, that, that's uh, rechargeable is usually nickel cadmium. And there's no, not much competition. Uh, if you look at the uh, lithium iron phosphate, for example, uh, a lot of the uh, up and coming uh, recyclers of batteries, of AV batteries, uh, don't want to touch it. They're, they're, they end up uh, having to take some of them because the agreement they have, uh, they get a batch. I mean, there's a percentage that might be these batteries. And we had discussion with these people where they said, well, would you take them off our hands? Because even just storing these batteries is a problem for them. Uh, it's not the type of batteries that have uh, metals that are super expensive, like nickel or, or, uh, or cobalt, for example. And a lot of the other uh, up and coming or, or being deployed right now, depending on what stage they are, but the other battery recyclers are basing their uh, business model on the recycling of cobalt and as a second, a secondary uh, or an afterthought of nickel. So, um, so getting the lithium out of these batteries is very expensive for with most of the other process. Uh, pyro would do okay 
you still have to attack it with some acid after when when that slag is out but you can separate a bunch of metals just with the uh, pyro process um when you get to 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 these things uh they often scrap a lot of the metals or, or create metals that are not of the purity that you want for batteries we figured out that if you if you look at the two processes side by side or in parallel uh, nickel cadmium and the life batteries or the lithium iron is that the first few steps uh, from the battery getting uh, off the boats and in the plant and, and being dismantled and, and crushed uh, up to when we uh, have the black mass. So when we separate pretty much the same element that you have in your battery, uh, you have your steel, the copper, you're going to have uh, battery carbon or graphite, and you're going to have aluminum. Aluminum being a fairly big size. Um and uh, and then you have your anode, uh, your cathode, I mean, uh, material, and and the um, you end up with a black mass. So that's your cathode material. Our process does not change the physical uh, structure of the the metals. So what we're looking at doing is, at least for some of the potential off takers we, we we're in touch with, is to regenerate that material. So to sell a product out of the life battery, that is the uh, the lithium, iron, and phosphate, in the same proportion that they were in the battery, probably even a little bit cleaner or of a higher purity, and sell it directly to these manufacturers. So instead of spending good money to separate them and have them as different products for which we need to find different buyers, uh, we would sell the whole package as a uh, like like a uh, a premix cake, uh, but for battery manufacture. So that's one of the production. Uh, for the first uh, part of the feasibility, we're looking at just producing that and not doing further conversion with that type of battery. For the nickel cadmium, it's a bit different. Or the black mass that we end up with, uh, if you look at the uh, press release we put out um, in uh, January, I think was the 13 or in that, in that area. Um, we, you see the value of the metals in it. About 25 person, 20 to 30 person, depending on, on the, the brand of the battery will be cadmium. Cadmium is an issue. Uh, it's not a super expensive material and it's a limited market. Uh, then uh, this is something that you want uh, to not lose money on, but being able to sell it back to either the, the battery manufacturer or to the steel industry or you know specialized application and then you're left with uh, the crown jewel which is the cobalt and the nickel and and that's uh you know what we want to do there and you saw we talked about uh the code that you we gave or the the, the brand that we gave to uh, the new tech that we're testing with uh the coal smoke uh, nickel when we say that uh, and uh you know, it's not to be funny, it kind of describe what we're doing, is that we're using uh, low pressure and low heat to extract the cadmium, convert it into gas, recuperate it out, so it's a pure cadmium, probably, you know, better purity than what came in initially, that we can sell to the market. But it's worth a few hundred dollars per ton, and obviously then transportation costs eat your, any type of positive or profit on. Then you're, you have uh, the nickel, which would be 15 to 25% of the battery. So every four tons, five tons of battery that comes into the plant, uh, then you end up, or, or the cathodes that are being processed into the plant, uh, is a nickel that you can sell either as a concentrate and ship to somebody else who's going to do the final uh, transformation, the, the you know, purification, and then the melting. Uh, and, and make ingots, or we can do ingot ourselves. So, because we test, the, the goal initially was to do concentrate. And because cadmium would still be present and contaminate the other material, we had to move to the purification. And by doing so, we stumble upon this stack where we can actually do nickel uh, ingot right away. We could do ingots that contain a cobalt, or we could also get the cobalt out of the mix and have cobalt as a concentrate, a pure concentrate, being sold on the silos. But this is something that could bring 
back when we did the press release in January, we'd bring $5,000 US per ton of uh, the cathode black mass being processed. Uh, today, it's probably a little bit more than that. Uh, it feels like January was like another century for nickel and cobalt price. Indeed, nickel has gone up in value quite considerably since uh, you put out that press release. Um, okay, so I'm glad you touched on the shipping aspect of this because this is something that kind of plays into location, location, location. Um, right now, you've scrapped the original building in Bay Como, but Bay Como is not off the table. You still have a deep seaport, which gives you access to the eastern seaboard. Um, but you're also looking at Hamilton, maybe Bay Concours, and other places that might make more sense. Where do you foresee building your first plant right now, Frank? Um, given until until what we, we have the final uh, feasibility and we can compare numbers, uh, I would probably not comment on this. Like we're looking right now at Ville de la Bay in Bay Como. Uh, in Quebec, and then we're looking at uh, Contrecoeur in Quebec. So it, we're not looking at, uh, at Bécancourt. We did eliminate Bécancourt okay. for a, a suite of reasons. One, it's getting crowded, which means also that the uh, capacity to receive and ship by boat there will also be crowded, and same thing for the train. Um, and another aspect, you mentioned transport. Transport is uh, the core of what we'll be doing. So you either transport the battery in and then transport the material out, and you want to reduce these transportation. The least amount of transport you do, or manipulation even, I would say, the best it is. Um, I'm just going to touch on this one quick comment. 40, 50% of some of these batteries, the mass or the volume is aluminum. So having your plant close to an aluminum smelter or close to a client that will take the aluminum off your ends and pay you for it, is a big plus because you don't have to retransport all this. You just reduce your cost by half. And then um, the other aspect is uh, Becamo and uh, and uh, La Bay have an advantage. You have deep sea ports. You can bring Panamax. In case of Becamo, technically, you can bring China Max boat. So you can bring big amount of material and ship big amount of material also. And you have a, uh, in both cases, you have access to the rail. Becamo is a bit different. It's, it's a ferry that transports your, your uh, carts or your train carts uh, to Matan. And then it connects to the North American uh, system or network. And you can bring Lakers also. So we have access to the Great Lakes. We have access to the world. And we have access to the train tracks there. And if something needs to be brought in or out uh, in you know, just in time, uh, we also have trucks that can carry it. But we need to contain our transport costs. And really, that's that's the key. The um, so La Bay is a bit similar to Becamo on this, and uh, you have uh, Contreca, which is close to Montreal. We're close to New York, also. It's connected to all the infrastructure. It's in the, actually, Contrecoeur is an extension of the Port of Montreal, but it's a new extension with some capacity. So it, it's uh, still interesting. The problem, I would say, coming close to big center and not staying in region is one cost of infrastructure. So building you know, the land, stuff like that, will obviously be more expensive. But it's also the retention of your manpower. One of the reason, uh, not the primary reason, one of the reasons we're not going to become cool is that there's maybe 30 companies that will do things that are adjacent to what we plan to do. Um, that means you, you train someone after you suffer for six months to get uh, an employee that you want. And three months later, you see him just you know working for somebody else, not necessarily competitors, but somebody who's in an adjacent uh, business. And... Uh, we want to avoid that. There, there's an advantage to be a bit away from uh, the other guys. So what's the thinking behind Hamilton then? Hamilton is, uh, well, you just touched something I can not necessarily go too deep into, but uh, I would say uh, you're good at doing research. Look at the other business around. That's fair. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, I want to circle back because I forgot to ask you about something. I actually wanted to lead off with hydrogen. You put a picture out with a meeting with you and Rico and Sabin the other day. How did that meeting go? Uh, it was horrendous. 
<laughs> uh, too much coffee for me but uh the uh we we had to do a debriefing obviously uh sabin has been uh, you know uh dealing with his visa to go to uh to korea he's going to spend uh, a good part of the month of april there um and uh we needed to uh sabin is all, obviously has multiple ads with us uh he, he does run uh H2SX, but he's also involved uh, with us on the engineering process, on, on the flowcharts of, of the process. Uh, he's involved with the feasibility and uh, he's doing a few other things for us. Like uh, you're talking about someone who has a, a fairly good, um, with the government, I would say at the very least, but he has a fairly good uh, Rolodex or, or network of contacts, uh, can get things to advance and for once, uh, I would say, uh, if you look at Mark Billings, Enrico, me, a few other people on the board, we, we do have good Rolodex, we have good network of contacts, but they often overlap. And that's not the case with Sabe, which is great. Also, Sabe, as, uh, as, uh, in terms of his contact, the value is from Korea, it's, it's Japan, it's Asia. And uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, I could probably expand a little bit on that aspect because some people have been asking a lot you know, where we stand regarding the, the agreement with WinTech. Um, and I would say that uh, for us, uh, there's nothing negative, obviously. Sabin has to go there. There is uh, a certain uh, process that involves the Korean government. You have to look at who are the backers of, uh, of uh, WinTech. Uh, SK being one, and uh, and also uh, KBAC, uh, which is a fairly big financial backer. And they request like uh, two minutes before final uh, execution of the final agreement that they had meetings with Sabay and that they had a uh, discussion with us. Now, we're not, it's not necessarily conditioned that they want to impose. It looks like they're seeing opportunity and they might want to augment this agreement in some ways. Now, SK is obviously a company that owns a battery manufacturing operation. So I'm happy that they ask, uh, to be honest. So a uh, bit of a segue there uh, on, on the, the, the hydrogen. But uh, we needed to look, before Sabin uh, left, at uh, all the interaction and all the integration of uh, the hydrogen uh, element in St. George and uh, more in AVSX. Now, hydrogen by itself is not a, I would not call it a vertical in St. George. It's more something that uh, is touching all the other vertical. So it's an element that, that feeds from some of the vertical and, and provide uh, advantage to some others. So uh, we had to go through uh, the interaction, look at different uh, process. We discuss also equipment make uh, uh, manufacturers, agreement with them, uh, our personal experience uh, over time with some of these uh, large equipment makers um, or manufacturers. So that's that's the meeting we had. And, and um, it was also a meeting, uh, no, it's not something super confidential, but where we had to finalize the front end of the process and uh, decide on, uh, you know, who we're going to marry, who, 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 which equipment we're going to use at the end of the day, and under what condition uh, some of these manufacturers require certain deposits and uh, are willing to finance a good portion of the equipment. And some of these equipment are also uh, fully financeable by federal programs. So it was uh, a bit what the meeting was about. So it looks a lot more serious because we... We were wearing suits, but uh, it's just the regular stuff we tend to do. But it was uh, fun to have on a Friday morning, Enrico and Sabin, uh, you know, reinventing the world in front of me. I mean, it's an interesting vertical, especially considering 
And just the other day, uh, Ford put out a patent for a uh, hydrogen uh, combustion engine. So it adds a little bit of a, a dynamic to the, the direction that you're going. And as you say, this is a byproduct of the, the battery recycling, but it's its own process and its own through Wintech. Am I correct in saying that? Well, it, it is. It, obviously, we create a subsidiary just for that. There's good reason for it. Um, and... Uh, uh, the rules, for example, regarding carbon reduction uh, certification uh, and, and uh, carbon credits are not necessarily the same. Uh, these are complementary business, but they're not uh, the same business. So we wanted to be able to have different type of auditing and accounting. Uh, it's interesting, though, probably another question we're getting a lot on this one, and I don't want to necessarily just speak about uh hydrogen you would probably need to get sub on on a you know a space uh, uh interview instead but uh it's what you see in quebec right now and you see around the world there's a push for hydrogen because hydrogen is what's going to bridge uh transportation with electric now obviously if, if you're like me you're not going to jump on an air canada flight to london on a fully electric plane i will never do that first if you ever seen the amount of batteries that uh, burst in, on fire in the luggage currently uh, the lithium-ion batteries uh, i would still be a bit nervous about the plane you know running on this uh, so hydrogen is a solution and, and it's probably the only solution right now i would, would buy you a few and uh, it's also the solution for remote areas where you need to, you won't, it makes no sense to try to get electricity close by because just charging your battery, you're going to need to charge your battery to go charge your battery type of thing. And uh, unless you start to bring generators using fuel, using oil, uh, or maybe a solar panel, stuff like that with, with uh, accumulators, but uh, it's complicated. It's for big applications. So there's two reasons to use hydrogen. One is for transportation as a fuel, and the other one is the calorific um, contribution. So uh, there's a lot of industrial process that will require high uh, temperature, and you cannot get that with uh, just uh, hydrolysis or electricity. You would need bunker seed or heavy oil. You will need natural gas, or you will need hydrogen. So now hydrogen is seen by a few uh, of the environmentalists as a... It's not a, not a good solution because for them, you just displace uh, what you do is, is you move green energy, being the electricity, and you spend and you're going to waste a lot of water to create uh, hydrogen from water. And uh, that's, that's, that's an issue. And you're going to see, for example, when I, I saw some comments on the question, when we say that we're going to do uh, the type of megawatt operation for the pilot plant, people assume that's the output. When you get to hydrogen, and we talk about megawatts of electricity, it's not a comparable in terms of energy. It's what's come, it, what is coming in the, the plant uh, to help with the process. So it's not what we produce on the way out. And in uh, the case of this process, with uh, or this technology with Wintech, um, it is not a situation where you lose any electricity. Actually, we, we, we multiply the energy at you. So it's really a green process versus uh, using electricity and water to do hydrogen. What you do is you displace the energy. It's just you, you move your storage from the electric grid to liquid hydrogen. And in a lot of the case, depending on the process, they have different process. Some are better than others. But in a lot of cases, you lose a portion of it. As you do it so the environmentalists don't really like it and they're saying you know hydrogen is not necessarily a green thing uh Sabay likes to say our hydrogen is uh, you know dark green because first we're using uh we're, we're using methane we're using uh biogas uh in quebec we have a lot of pork production so you can just see right there with the farmers the, the size of the feedstock we could have and we can process that. We turn that into uh, graphite on one side, actually carbon, battery carbon, and hydrogen. And that's the, the interesting part, is that there's nothing out of the process as a, a byproduct that's not saleable. 
uh, and uh, we're not using water, and we're bringing less energy into the process in terms of electricity, in terms of green energy, than we're producing on the way out. So, uh, I think this is a fantastic compliment to what you're doing. Yeah, and, and, and for us, we, we're going to need uh, to boost the energy uh, on the production of certain uh, some of our things. So, for example, we could use strictly uh, electricity, but we could also use uh, hydrogen produced out of the plastics and the PVC outside of, that we have in the batteries, convert that into a liquid that's usable for the hydrogen process, and at every plant that we have, recycling battery, have a little bit of uh, hydrogen production. So that uh, allows us to uh, double down on, on our, our commitment to be as green as possible. If we have an excess, if we can sell a little bit uh, on top, perfect. Uh, but uh, the goal is to be self-sufficient uh, at first. All right. On that note, let's talk about being self-sufficient. Let's talk about financing, Frank. How does one go about financing these various initiatives you have? You have your spodumene, you have your battery recycling. Um, you know, like, where is the financing going to come from? Is this going to be dilutive? Or are you going to look at debt securities? Or how are you going to go about this? It's always tricky to talk about it when you know, for example, if you look at the exploration projects, uh, talking about financing, outside of financing exploration, uh, runs you fairly quickly into regulatory issues because you need to have the independent pre-feasibility or feasibility uh, or the bankable feasibility. And so I, we, we voluntarily steer away from that and answer that type of question when we get to these projects. Now for the batteries, it's a bit different. We're looking at uh, a situation where you need to buy land, you need to buy buildings uh, or lease it, and you need to uh, buy equipment. Now all these equipment, there's program out there that allow us to receive a loan guarantee on a portion of it. We still have to pay you know, a certain part of the equipment. We'll need to buy the building, but uh, this is not uh, like the Manicuagan project. We cannot take a mortgage on Manicuagan, but we can definitely take a mortgage on the building. Uh, we, can take, we can spread that mortgage over 25 years. We can do the same over five, 10 years on the equipment. There's balance of sales with the uh, the manufacturers. And if you look just at the front end equipment to do the 200 tons a day uh, type of equipment, uh, we're looking at for the first plant uh, on the first circuit, well, they uh, are all, in order to get the business, they are all providing the equipment with the financing. So that's not super dilutive. But I'm not saying we won't dilute. I can guarantee you it's, it's, a, it's a promise. It's rare I use that word. You've known me for long enough to know that now. It's a promise we'll dilute moving forward. Uh, we'll try to keep it. But let's be clear, Frank. <laughs> Hold on. You don't, you don't need to dilute like 100% of your financing. You can get real creative here, say, incorporate government grants, uh, a debt, uh, like you say, a mortgage, and you would only have say what between 10 and 30 percent of the overall yeah, cost definitely like we're looking we're looking at 15 to 30 person will need to come from our own financing uh you know this, that that is not attached to the building the land the equipment the infrastructure and uh that could be three forms so we either would get some advance offtake and they're willing to come in and in order to reserve a capacity with us uh, they're giving us some some level of financing. That could be just a guarantee of loan for an extra percentage. It could be just straight up cash, uh, where they buy a discount, a certain amount of nickel. Um, and that could be also uh, debentures. Uh, so we go to the public and we end up with, with, with some debt that's convertible and equity financing. Like the last thing we will do in St. George is do what we've seen in Quebec with a few big uh, CapEx project in the last 10 years, where they went out, they financed everything with debt because they were pressured by their retail shareholders to never issue one shares, never dilute, you know, by one shares. And they end up financing 90% of the project, then ran out of money five minutes before they turned the key in and start the operation. And they went bankrupt. And what happened when they went bankrupt? 
all the common shares got cancelled. So the shareholders end up with absolutely nothing. And that's a situation that you don't want to happen. You, you need to, to make it clear to everyone, we will dilute as the least amount possible, but we'll, we'll definitely dilute for exploration because there's still some pain to get to the resource where we can get alternative type of financing. And we'll dilute for the, uh, the battery plant. Now, if you look at spodumene, that's different. Uh, there is opportunity there to probably partner with, uh, with people. It's not a license, again, but it's something where we, we join force with uh, potential off-takers because it's, it's a fairly more simple process. We, we bring X amount of material. The people that sell us that material could be part of that financing, you know, of the, the chain of credit. They send us the material or the concentrate, uh, I would say, as a consignment. We convert it into a product. And then everybody sit down and do a share uh, profit sharing uh, agreement. So same thing with, with the equipment provider on this one. But uh, this one will have its own most probably, I would say the big chance are, uh, we're not finalized on this, but there's a big chance we will do feasibility study on this one to go finance it separately and have um, St. George or EVS6, and it's mostly St. George, by the way, for the, the spodumene, it's, it's St. George Metallurgy, uh, to, to act more as an engineering or a patent office on this one, even if we deploy our expertise to run it as a uh, industrial uh, showcase plant. So is it fair to say that your industrial showcase plant is ready to start showing the world what you can do with the spodumene? Uh, processing? Are we getting pretty close to that I, I now? I think the best way to quantify it is with uh, the term almost. So uh, we're, but but almost is a vague thing because it, we're uh, dependent now on uh, on supply chain. We're dependent on international transport yep. to get the material. Uh, if everybody pull their weight, uh, we are uh, ready to start uh, to look at how we're going to finance this and who we're going to bring on board. Uh, by the end of the second quarter. Now, okay, so that, that, that's still ahead. that still gives us some space and some margin. Uh, we're going to still need to be flexible uh, to optimize the process as we go, and optimize the second transformation or, or the final transformation that we're targeting, which is the uh, lithium hydroxide. Okay, so government's been pretty active lately in in talking about critical minerals, setting them up battery parks, particularly in Quebec. There's some activity happening in my backyard with a battery recycling facility happening in northern Ontario. Government's going to play a big role in all of this. Are you actively speaking with government officials? Have your lobbyists made any headways? Have you applied for grants? Where are you at with regards to bringing in government uh, affiliation? Uh, most of it is confidential. But I can say one thing is that I had to reactivate my uh, lobbyist uh, license. Same with Sabe. Uh, some other people in the company will have to do that in the coming days. And we have a bunch of lobbyists um, that are under contract with us. Um, if you had told me that 18 months ago, I would have laughed. Uh, the company is a different company today. Like this is uh, getting to a different, a different stage. And, and yes, we're in touch uh, on a daily with the government. So you brought in Paul Pelosi. He's no longer the president of EVSX, but he is an advisor and he's playing a key role for you behind the curtains. Can you kind of elaborate on where Paul's at today and what he's doing for the company? Um, I'll give you like fairly recent uh, uh, interaction <laughs> with Paul this week. Uh, I asked Paul, uh, to uh, get us in touch with his cousin, uh, who's the governor of uh, California, because they have a program there that uh, they're looking at doing that will be to allow the, uh, in order to collect more batteries of the uh, commercial type and the, uh, the residential type, all the batteries we want, uh, the, uh, they're looking at maybe transferring the rights to uh, the uh, some charities like the you know any organization looking like your junior baseball uh, league 
you know, or your hockey garage league, uh, you go door to door and you ask people, so do you have, you know, any old uh, batteries and power tool batteries lying around? We'll collect that. And uh, like you, you go door to door to collect, you know, empty bottles. And, uh, and we want to be part of this. And we're probably the only company right now in a position to be part of this and, and to, uh, you know, secure the, the access to these batteries. And how we're going to do it is we're probably going to sit down with these different organizations, especially the ones that are national organizations, and tell them every time that you go to one of your local or regional outfit and they want to do a financing like that, they want to do a, you know, a charity run or something like that, um, here's the template and, and we're going to have a profit sharing agreement with you. So go get us the batteries. We'll pick them up as bulk. We'll process them and then we'll sit down, open book, share the profit. So that's one thing, but the, the access to yeah. that, deploying a program like that is 10 years in the making. And then you bring Paul Pelosi and it's like five minutes because uh, the first phone call is calling the person that decide on, on, on these things and you can, from the top down, tell the people in the public administration, one, these guys are serious, due diligence is done, and just talk to them. See, see uh, you know, come back with reason not to do it. And... Uh, and if you don't find any reason not to do it, then do it. So that's uh, that's something that's fairly that well, it, it's very interesting. Like I, I have good contact with politicians. I can reach out uh, even during the Jean Chrétien era. Like I could ask for support letter for project from uh, the PMO, from the, the Prime Minister office under Jean Chrétien. Obviously, any conservative government, it's fairly easy for me to to, to reach out. Uh, but Paul is uh, on another planet when it comes in another universe. When it, it, it gets to uh, Paul, I, we've asked him on a Friday to reach out to Canadian minister. And we thought, okay, he's going to book us something for in two weeks. And the minister is going to come back or his people, they're going to vet us first. One, they will want to know why and whatnot. And then I get a call on Monday morning. Uh, I'm just having my first coffee and Paul's telling me I've been 90 minutes on the phone with the minister. It's like, great. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the kind of reach that he brings to the table. And don't forget, Paul also yeah. was a environmental commissioner. Now, we're talking to different uh, recycling and, and garbage commission, you know, like uh, in different areas of Quebec, Ontario and the U.S., and we see them a little bit like the uh, the integrators because they're they're on the receiving ends of a lot of batteries also that often they just have to put uh, in the landfill. And uh, there's a there's a culture with these people. There's uh, even terms of reference that I was not fully aware that Paul Paul speaks their language, and he's like uh, yeah like the Wayne Gretzky of that business that's sitting with you, and you're talking to minor league coach, so. They listen. Indeed, having a guy like Paul in your back corner is always an asset for sure. Um, so let's uh, let's just touch base on Manicwag. And I know I've kept you here a little longer than you anticipated, so I apologize for that. I could ask you a lot more questions because there's a lot in my mind, but Manicwag. You're drilling in the fall. Uh, everybody's kind of hoping for results. Where are you at with all of this, Frank? <laughs> I, I wish... I wish I would be able to tell you a fixed date. Um, I would say we, we, we took out, we did very fairly good with, uh, you know, Manicuagan is a fly in fly out project. Now, every time you bring a plane yes. with, uh, on the shift change, for example, you, you bring uh, dr new drillers, a fresh batch of drillers, and you get the other one for their, their week off out of there. Uh, you're not allowed to bring equipment with. You're not allowed to bring, for example, to sling on the chopper. You're not allowed under the helicopter to carry uh, any type of cargo. So uh, you have a limited amount of flights you can bring in. And uh, every single flights that we were allowed to bring out of there that was empty in terms of cargo uh, brought core out of there. At the same time, when we get to uh, the um, when we get to the Gagnon Airport. Uh, we need to have people in place ready to reception and sit there and wait. If there's two or three trips, we need constantly somebody to watch the uh, the, the cargo because uh, 
we've we've got some of our bulk sample the first batch that we tried to do for tests back in july it got stolen people saw shiny rocks in a pile and uh they left with half of it probably thinking it was pure gold but uh so we have to uh we're, we're limited in what we can do we got most of the core of the historical core so the 5000 uh, meters was out of there by end of november early december we got a good amount of the uh 2021 uh, drilling also out of there and uh, the last core came out uh, about two weeks ago when i was in becamo when we were uh carrying the uh, the fuel for this season and so when the the chopper was coming back it was coming back with pallets of uh core box so you have different uh core that went were sent to the lab the, the process is they get to Lebe to the core shack they get washed clean lug documented by the geologists uh, it gets split and then uh, they decide which section is going to go and, and every section is being passed on for radioactivity because that's data we have to provide uh to uh some of the people that have the rights uh, the ancestral rights on the main and uh because they want to make sure that there's no uranium we don't think there's any uranium in the settings in the geological settings but we do that extra step that to go through every core and, and log anything that would be like barely over background uh, but also we put the xrf on it so that tells us if there's presence of nickel now in some case we end up having material situation or, or, or stuff that we need to inform the public by regulation uh, all 18 for example was one of them when you see that one meter of pure metals and you know there's nickel in it without knowing the the grades of the nickel but you know there's nickel in it and, and knowing the settings you have to disclose which we did um but then you need to prepare the samples ship that to the lab in the case of uh, some of these samples the content of sulfur uh, didn't allow us to ship that just with all the other one by normal transport it had to be put on a flat bed you know uh, trailers and drove to uh, the lab now we send material to one lab that's supposed to do and it's not done yet but it's supposed to do uh, atomic absorption which is going to give us a better read especially for if we think we have high grade material. And uh, now we're looking at getting these readings later this year. And, and we're talking probably end of June, maybe July. So that's for one of the lab. When we saw that, we talk about a lab that needs to have isotope, and you're, we're in line with you know hospitals that are expecting isotope for medical tests. Uh, so we're not the absolute priority, even if we're putting a rush on it. So we ask them to clone these these samples to actually you know we said you send for example the two kilo samples they'll take only 200 uh, grams of a uh, representative uh, sample so they'll, they'll mix the whole thing pulverize it mix it so we asked them to send additional uh, samples to um, a regular lab now it's not going to be as precise but uh, we know that uh, we'll get still a fairly good uh, idea and that uh, we're expecting to have it now any days so we're, we're waiting for some because and the reason why i'm telling you that is that in the process also when the lab comes back to you often with high grade stuff they're going to say okay you have three metals in the, the the 40 metals for example that we're testing for three metals are over the threshold they're over um i'll give you an example with arsenic because that one nobody cares but arsenic over 10,000 ppm uh has to be sent for a second test and uh that what's uh and that this is what happened uh on a few meters of all 18 where it had to be sent because too many metals were over the trash and uh, so we know we have material over the trash we already have an idea that there's something interesting coming our way if you ask me uh in my uh wildest dreams what will uh probably have me drink uh you know a few scotch uh, the minute following the uh, the announcement is anything equivalent over a meter two meters uh than what we we got on all 17 historically because that would mean that at the same depth for over 180 to 200 meters long we have material 
that is fairly, uh, you know, fairly similar. And then it's the beginning of something big. And then we can expand on this. And uh, that would move us from, a, I would say, a green field uh, to, uh, to, to a brown field type of projects where now we're starting to think, okay, we have something. We have a model and we can, even for the geos, they'll start to do back of the envelope. They'll start to do modeling. They'll start to do uh, even production model saying, okay, we're may, we might be looking at either an open pit or we're looking at an underground operation. Uh, and then this gets augmented with the grade. Obviously, if we get grades of two person plus, uh, we're looking at edits or, or, or underground operation because it's worth it uh, if it's high grade as much as that. So uh, anything, if you ask me, anything, two, one meters, two meters, a two person plus, and a few grams, two, three grams of PGEs, I am the most happy guy, and I know that uh, the institutional backers will be there to finance every operation. Well, I think everybody here would be very happy to see those kinds of grades. But just to just to clarify something, I mean, a lot of people oh, have been way, approaching I, me lately. By, by the way, Mike, if we get one person, I'm still happy. Yeah. It just means, oh yeah, it, no, it just I, means I, we I need agree. to keep looking in case there's lens of higher grade. Uh, but one person is still pretty good. You, you, one of your clients is doing fantastically with grades that are fraction of that, and, and it makes sense. Yes. And it made sense at five thousand dollars a ton. Imagine today at you know thirty five, forty, fifty thousand Canadian a ton. Oh, absolutely. And you've made the comparison to Voices Bay. I think it's a little bit early to go there, but uh, you know, we may be very well having that conversation in a I've, couple I've of months. Made, saying I've, it's I've, a- made, I've made it because oh. I'm a bit of an idiot on these things. You know, I've been a amateur prospectors. I know that project inside out, and I tend to do things backward. Uh, not announcing a resource before we drill, but mostly doing the metallurgy first uh, to make sure that we're not yeah. wasting our time on something that we will never be able to put into production, even if there's massive quantity of it. So we've done characterization, we've done metallurgy on it, we've done crystal analysis. So we have a recrystallized uh, material over there, and that's interesting. That That's, uh, if we look at the bulk sample, I've heard like there's people bombarding me saying, why did you alt the stock for this? First, we don't choose to alt the stock. I want to make that clear. I think I said that before, but High Rock decide to help us. They're going to put at company request because they don't want us to look bad. They want it to look like it's in collaboration with us. But uh, when I sent that to High Rock, we were planning to put it out after the market to not, you know, cause any disadvantage to anyone who would get the news a few minutes after somebody else. Give ample time for dissemination. And then it's their geologists that did a conference call back to us and say, hey, this is like beyond, you know, it is material like uh, to a level where we need to alt you now. We don't care if you put it out tomorrow, you're altered as per now. And uh, so that's one thing. But the market perceive it way differently. Like first, it's, we're not talking grab samples here. We're talking surface on multi amount of meters, blast uh, of rocks at surface that we take tons of it, not choose and sample we didn't go send a geologist there with a lens and uh, you know and a small hammer to just pick up shiny stuff we just picked up rocks in bulk and you end up with these results that gives you two two to three person nickel imagine if we get that on the corridor anything like even we get the low end of the 236 person we got in the bulk at surface and we get that at 45 meters deep or 50 meters you know, uh, of land on all 18. One, two, three meters, we're, we're, we're golden. This is fantastic. That'd be exciting, that's for sure. So, so that bulk <laughs> sample, it's, it's unfortunate that people didn't realize we're not talking grab sample. And I think a lot of the people that call me now, we, we, we have a lot of investors that came for the batteries. You know, you remember we, we've done some pooling for this, and it's 60, 65% that came for the batteries. So it's probably the first mining exploration company they ever put money in, they ever even been interested in, in following, and maybe the last one also, <laughs> but that's another thing. And uh, they, a lot of the shareholders we have are, are getting uh, 
you know, inform or, or making their uh, mining exploration education with us. And uh, they're going around and asking things like, we have people that call as well. Yeah, like 50 plus percent of iron ore. Did you have an iron ore mine? So, no, we, we don't. Like, uh, we, we have uh, Ariane Julie at 60, 70 percent iron ore with, uh, with uh, magnesium at 10, 15 percent historically. But as long as we don't have half a point of nickel, uh, where we can now start to talk about maybe if we get size, if we ever we come up with a resource for that section, we can talk about uh, you know ferro nickel or things like that. Uh, we don't have a iron ore mine because an iron ore mine is not about the grade. It's never about the grade. And, and by the way, you need to look at if you have more than fifty percent iron Fe. You need to look at Fe203 because that's the product. That's the 64, 65 percent wet ton, uh, or 62 percent Fe on subtype of of iron ore. But at the end of the day, it's always a transportation uh, project. It's the cost to bring it to Asia. It's the cost to bring it to the market. Uh, and if you have, uh, you might have 100 percent iron ore on uh, Manicouagan. Unless we find billions of tons at 100 percent, it's never going to be a, an iron ore project. Uh, it will always be either a PGE project, depending on the grades we're getting, with credits of nickel, copper, cobalt, and, and a slurry of other material, um, or it, it's going to be a, a nickel project with all these other things, including rhodium, ruthenium, and indium, uh, depending how the metallurgy allows us to separate it. Although so far, it looks like we can separate all of this and, and you know, get uh, massive banks for a box if we get space. Oh, oh, I want to pause you right there. You're absolutely right, because you said something that I think a lot of people are going to miss in all of this conversation, is that you have a recrystallized project, and you do things a little bit differently than your average explorer. And I've noticed that because I work with exploration companies. You do do things a little bit differently. Doing the metallurgy first is uh, generally something that happens after you've drilled X amount of holes, you're getting close to be able to put together a 43101, you think you have a pretty decent deposit, then you go ahead and do the metallurgical work. In your case, you've done that a little bit differently and for good reason, um, because there is historical work that shows that you have sporadic PGE and nickel and copper and rhodium and ethereum on this property. It looks really interesting. But one of these big questions that I keep getting from investors and I, I shake my head and I'm like why would you even think this but no people need to understand you're not going to formulate a 43 101 based on 35 holes um, what you can do is be proactive and do the metallurgical work to see it's even if it's even worthwhile but you're not going to get that 43 101 but having said that Frank and this is where my question comes into play this year's exploration program are you going to focus on doing some infill drilling within this 200 meter well, corridor? And when the rest of the results come in, will you look at expanding <laughs> and maybe building out a resource for next I, year? I think I can probably tell you what we're going to do for the first three months. Uh, after that, based on the results we get on the first three months, well, now. the first thing we're going to do is we first, we might be there with two drills instead of one. So that's going to accelerate the process because you don't have to dismantle the drill. Uh, and then move move it in parts and re put it back together at the new site with with the helicopter. Uh, we've been accelerating this by building drill pads, mobile drill pads that we just move with the helicopter, put the drills on it. You know, we put back the drill together on it, and then we go back to where we did the drill hole, move the pad to the next drill. So we've been able to get fairly good at this at accelerating the process, so that we have. Minimum downtime. Down now, with two drills, this is going to be probably going a little bit better. And, and we're going to have a surface drill, which we don't expect that's easier to move, probably won't need any drill pad. We might have also a new technology to drill at surface. Um, and we'll bring also probably a few uh, smaller drill, our backpack drill, to really do just surface exploration with a few meters of drilling, especially if there is material at surface that's looks interesting so there is a way to kind of figure out how all this connects together when you look at the metallurgy when you look at the crystal and that's that's why the pack pack drill the back pack drill sorry becomes interesting because they give us like a a, a good read a good initial read on on areas that have been under explore so first three months we're going in we're going to do a few deep holes 
to do down old geophysics. Then we're going to move from it and probably okay. do additional drilling in between these two faults on that 15 kilometers corridor, uh, but probably just expanding est, uh, east and west of the, the zone where, let's say, we'll, we'll probably move a few tens of meters east of Old 17, uh, the historical one, with fantastic grades, and then, depending on what happens on the other holes, uh, expand on some of the high-grade holes. If we if we get any high-grade holes, if we get average holes, we'll adjust. Uh, so far, we have surface very high-grade, and we have old seventeen historical old seventeen that's very high-grade also. And and so we don't know enough yet to know what direction we're going to drill. And the first phase definitely not in field drilling. And field drilling is going to be done uh, when we come back uh, after a few, with the results come back or we get some early information and we get the geophysical information with one drill being able to do deep holes and another one doing these 100, 120 meters deep uh, that we've been doing all along so far. So uh, these these are the holes that at surface it mineralization. Uh, to this day, we still don't know if you go below uh, 200 meters, is there anything there? And, and we might be just scratching the surface, getting excited for a size of mineralization that is maybe the consolation price. Maybe the big price is below us, and it, it's time now, and, and we have the resource to do it, to go and, and tap uh, and plug a hole in these uh, uh, system a little bit deeper. And some, so some people need to be cautioned here and understand that some of the, the most successful and um, you know, amazing ore deposits that have been identified in the last hundred years. Some of them have taken two to three hundred holes into these things to identify an actual deposit. So, to get the kind of results that you're getting in your first pass, mind you, there's some historical stuff, is pretty impressive. But what prompted you to expand your land package the way you did, Frankie? You, you added an awful lot of claims around stuff where I've seen the geophysics, it looks east west, but you seem to have added a lot on a northeast southwest uh, trend. It's probably the, the last thing that? I can talk about, and then I'm gonna have to run to go get my daughter at daycare but uh the uh, uh okay Sorry. Keep it so long. <laughs> and uh the uh th there's there's one element is that first we, we're still not even fixed is it a nickel the uh you know project uh i stay away from the turn deposit but is it a, a nickel project or is it a palladium rhodium project we don't know that yet and the batch of results coming in okay. might actually answer that Historically, it was worked differently. The 5,000 meters barely have, uh, I don't think we were over 1,000 meters that was split and test. So there's 4,000 meters that was untouched because you couldn't see visually mineralization in it. It was disseminate sulfide and stuff like that. And so far, a few spot tests we've done with that material. And, and if you look at the, the geophysics also, that material is on a contact with the IMAG but it's also in the low mag uh, section. So it's a tr tricky geophysics when you get 50% plus iron ore. Um, and uh, so sure. the, the idea is now we realize the sections sometimes lose nickel entirely. Like we're getting uh, low grade nickel uh, and even no nickel whatsoever. No, uh, it's undetectable in some areas. But then somehow copper and uh and pgs uh, jump up so there's a lot of these sections that have been totally ignored historically because we couldn't see we couldn't confirm presence of nickel but that doesn't mean that we're not looking at high grade pgs and and it's fairly big we're talking about you know a lot of square kilometers of it Yeah, no, it is a quick land package, and I can't wait to get up this, there this year. I know I've kept you for probably double the length of time that you agreed upon today, so I apologize for that. But thank you very much, Frank, for joining us today. I do have more questions. If you want to do this again, we can uh, we can definitely kick up a, a space uh, sometime in the very near future if you're interested in doing so. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks, everybody, for joining today in the uh, the first Inside Exploration uh, space. Let us know how we did. Uh, reach out to me if you have any additional questions, and I'll see if I can get them answered. Hey, everyone. 
Thanks for tuning into our Twitter space today. If you enjoyed the content of our show, please subscribe to our channel and follow us at InsideExploration.com. If you're looking for our social media handles, they can be found in the description below. Thanks again for joining us. I'm your host, Mike Coyle, and you're watching Inside Exploration.